Welcome to the Virtual CPA Success Show for creative agencies, the go-to resource for agency owners looking to scale their business. Join us every week to stay ahead of the curve and position your agency for future success. Hello, everybody. Very excited about today's show. Um, we're bringing on Michael Johnson from Business Choreography to talk about actual true choreography. He has a, um, a background in ballroom dancing, which he's um, really proud of. And kind of it's it's cool to me when um, people come into the consulting business uh, from somewhere other than business. Um, we have I've met people that are in improv and now someone in dancing. And so I think it, it's really cool when they can ap apply that craft in their previous life to business consulting. And so a lot of really good information coming out of this one. So hopefully you enjoy it. Hello everybody, welcome to today's show. Um, first I wanna apologize to the audience that I'm, I'm running solo. So no uh, no other person from Summit here. It's just me, uh, Jamie Na with uh, Summit CPA. But I think our guest is gonna, is gonna carry this show. We talked a little bit before the show. I think he's got a lot of good stuff to bring. So uh, welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me today and, uh, and allowing me to come and join you and your audience. Cool. Yeah. So this is, this is Michael Johnson. Um, he's with, uh, with business choreography. Um, so if you want to tell us a little bit about you and about your background and kind of what you do over there. Absolutely. I'll try to keep this painfully short, uh, <laughs> but uh, I have a very colorful background. Uh, I actually started off as a dancer. I, I started dancing uh, ballroom dance when I was five. And wow. worked my way through the ranks. Uh, my my mother had great vision. I danced all the way up into the professional mm -hmm. ranks and danced on the pro circuit for about 10 years. It's a very competitive circuit. And a lot of people don't even know it exists other than what they see on Dancing with the Stars. But <laughs> it's a, uh, a huge, huge world, the ballroom dance world. Uh, during that time, I uh, became a life coach, started a business, and started into my entrepreneurial journey during my professional career because I kind of looked at it and knew my shelf life for my body was going to not be as long as maybe I wanted it to be. And that's that's the same for a lot of professional athletes. So I uh, danced on the circuit for 10 years, started having kids, so left that realm and, and went full swing into the business uh, realm. And... Uh, and have been doing stuff in that space ever since. Uh, currently doing a lot of business investing as well as uh, just managing and running different uh, the different investments that we've uh, gotten on board into our portfolio. And so we, of course, pull the concept of choreography from our dance days, which right, right. <laughs> obviously makes sense. And, um, and we've pulled that into the business world. What we saw was that so many businesses out there and so much of the talk in the business space isn't surrounding how everything works together. And what we realized from our dancing days was that no matter what level you were at, you always needed a choreographer. And that really hit home when we had the world champions in uh, one of the businesses I owned was a competitive studio. And we had the world champions in visiting and teaching and coaching. And we said, hey, where are you going next? And they said, oh, we're going to visit our choreographer. And we went, you're the 10 time world champions. <laughs> what do you mean? And uh, they so kindly explained that, hey, they help us see our shortcomings. They help us see our assets. They help us put things together in a new way and they become our outside eyes and they help us to really choreograph together the best of who we are and what we do. And I loved that. And I felt like in business, because of the speed of tech and the internet, there's so many flash in the pan ideas going around, so many tactics and strategies being thrown out there. And we looked at it and we were sucked in and we did every one of those tactics and we had a book funnel and we did a summit and we had, I mean, we must have tried everything at some with varying degrees of success along the way. And what we realized was that it wasn't about any one of those tactics or strategies. It was about choreography. And so then the next question is, well, what's choreography? Well, choreography to us, what we realized was creating experiences. See, I'm a professional dancer, and if you ask me to dance at any given time, most people are going to be pretty like, yeah, that's amazing. You're really yeah. great. <laughs> but if I put a costume on, then it's an even better experience. And if I match it with some music, then it's an even better experience. And if I take that and I put it inside a show with other dancers that were doing the same, now it's an even better experience. And so as you look at business and look at the different levels, 
that each person or each company brings to the table, whether they're a startup or whether they're a Inc. 500 corporation, it doesn't matter the level of experience that they're providing, not only for their customers, for their team members, but even for the senior management and the owners. The experience is the important part, and that's what choreography brings to the table. So that's a little bit of the the history of business choreography, kind of my journey. Uh, I mean, in a nutshell, and uh, I guess we can go from there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a that's a great intro. So I, as I was listening to you talk there, I kind of I went down a couple paths. So when you first started talking about your business and working with that original dance group, I was like, okay, it's kind of like a coaching type thing. And then you kind of went down the experience. And so, um, can you kind of go into that a little bit? The difference between business coaching and helping businesses build experience, and kind of what the what the path is for someone that works with you. There's a, a huge realm. And one of the pieces I left out of my journey was I did take a, a pause for a number of years to become a master NLP practitioner and, and, uh, and trainer. And so I have that in my background. And one of the things that you learn right away is there's a very clear difference between coaching and consulting and being an agency, which hopefully this will help uh, some of the businesses listening right now. When you're a coach, it, it, you're an advanced babysitter, right? And I, I say that in the nicest way, not in the <laughs> most degrading way you could think of it. So take it in the nicest way. And those of you that have been doing any coaches out there or coaching out there, you understand what I'm talking about. You're there to guide them, to pull out the knowledge that they have and actually get them to do it. I mean, the number of businesses I've talked to in my day when I was in my coaching phase where I'm sitting there saying, well, you know the answer. Why haven't you done it? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, you know, and it's excuse after excuse. And really a great coach can help them be accountable. When you take that next step to a consulting kind of a role, a consultant comes in because of their advice, because they have experience and they have advice that they can give to someone or a group of people and say, all right, let's diagnose what you're doing what's going on, what the problem is. And let me come up with some prescriptions. Usually the best consultants don't say you have to do it this way. They say you could do it this way or this way or this way. Now, what seems like it's going to be best? And they take a little bit of a coaching approach, right? So there's a lap over. And then the agencies have a lap over with the consultancies, right? The agencies are in going, well, we'll build you a website. Let me, let me just do it for you. You know I'm the best website person, but let me just build it for you. And then some of those agencies take on a slight consulting view or a slight coaching view where they add those elements into the agency. So those three different elements really help define what it's all about. What we tend to do is we tend to stay on the more of a consulting side where we come in and we go, listen, <laughs> Your show sucks. <laughs> right? so when we talk about experience, the show you just put together, you took into account maybe the owner's perspective, but you didn't take in the other. Or you took into account the client's perspective, but you didn't actually check with your team to see if you could actually fulfill on that and sustain it over time. So the idea really is that as we build experience for the overall whole, we have to take on the right approach. What does your company do? Is it purely done for you? Okay. Is it purely consulting or is it purely coaching or does it have some element of each? And once you know that, now you can choreograph that all together to, to really bring out the best of the business and the best of your clients. So I, maybe this is a, a bad question, but I'm curious about when you're working with different groups, which of those experiences are they usually the worst at providing? Is it internal? Is it external? Is it um, another one that I'm not thinking of? Which experience do you usually have to start with and be like, okay, this is the one you guys really have to figure out first? Honestly, it, it really changes per business. There was okay. a time pre Zappos era. I don't know if you remember the company yeah. Zappos, right? But, <laughs> but before that era and that concept of really over delivering on the customer service end and really changing your company culture, right? They really made it popular. Zappos mm -hmm. really brought it in the forefront. And before that era, it was really just like, who cares, right? Right. It, it should, nobody, <laughs> nobody gave a crap, right? And right. nowadays, 
the company culture is talked about a lot. There's always a big conversation around what your team looks like. I mean, I drive down the freeway here. I'm from Utah and Adobe is right off the freeway. You can see their offices, beautiful, beautiful buildings, multiple. And you can see inside they've got a basketball court and they have a workout gym that you can see. And they did that on purpose from the freeway, right? Because they're creating a company culture that's huge uh, and very important to them to make sure that they can retain their, not necessarily just their customers, but their employees that they've invested so much in. They want them to stay. (laughs) Imagine that. And so depending on where you're at, I mean, if you're a newer company, sometimes it's about building the culture and realizing that the the talent you bring in, it takes time and money and effort to train them. And you might want to keep them longer than a flash in the pan. But if you're talking to the longer, you know, the, the companies that have been around for a long time, oftentimes they get very disconnected and I'm calling you out all you big companies, you get very disconnected from your actual client. And then you wonder why your growth just sort of, you know, flatlines. And it's because maybe you're, all about company culture and about how you're growing and the investments and how can we go public and all these wonderful things that are important, but you've gotten so far removed from your customer that everybody's forgotten about creating their experience. So I think it, I think it really does range depending on where you're at in your, in your progression. Yeah, that's kind of the answer I expected. I wouldn't expect it to be a one size fits all, especially, you know, like, like you said, I've worked for companies that have had really, bad um employee experience and most of the time they also had really bad customer experience <laughs> so like i think there's there's a correlation there it's like okay, you gotta figure both you gotta figure both out so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i guess my, my next question for you is, is so you, you talked a lot about you know knowing the customer and knowing what their experience is so you as a consultant how do you figure that out for companies do you go in and like start meeting with the clients and meeting with the customers or do you just take their word for it so how do you how do you learn that well depending on the number of clients they have, uh, you can do it different ways, but it's amazing how quickly you can tell the customer satisfaction by just talking to some of the staff and the team members. Yeah. They can't hide it very well. And, you know, I, I know we're not talking to team members and staff right now. We're probably talking to upper management and or owners. Mm -hmm. Truth of the matter is, is if I go in and I talk to your your team, I can probably see the telltale signs of bad customer experience just by how they're interacting and how they're talking. It's very rare that you have a great company culture with a whole lot of people that are running the machine. It's very rare that the customer experience is good when their experience is bad. Yeah, for sure. It, It just doesn't happen. Now, if we are taking it to that next level and we're saying, okay, yeah, you know what? Company culture is good. Senior management seems to be in good place and everybody thinks the customer is happy. I usually am that, um, you know, contrarian that comes in and goes, yeah, <laughs> prove it. Let's, <laughs> let's see. And so, you, you know, running surveys these days is so incredibly easy. If you have a, a clientele base that is engaged, and you think they like you, which happens a lot, Mm -hmm. they think they like them, then it should be incredibly easy to get their feedback by literally just serving them some more and giving them, I I know I'm going to say the evil dreaded word, free stuff, you know, but if you are providing a good service for your clients, if you go and say, Hey, we're willing to give you this free thing, which is valuable to them. If you'll just give us your feedback, this will take three minutes. They will all say yes. And this is a, a great way to do it. And you don't have to go. I mean, again, if you're a huge corporation, you can go like the Qualtrics route and get some yeah. like heavy data and get a statistician to come in and do all mm-hmm. of it. But you could also just get a Google form <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> put the questions in. I mean, obviously you should, you should do a little work on the questions you're asking because we tend to be most regular humans tend to be crappy at asking questions. Uh, we usually have to have somebody that's great at the statistical analysis that understands a little bit of language, 
Uh, you know, I studied NLP, so I was big on linguistics. I love the concept of how we talk matters. Mm -hmm. So if you ask a bad question, you're going to get a bad answer. So you have to at least take some effort into the questions that you're asking and realizing, hey, let me extrapolate this a little bit. What if they answered this in a positive way? What if they answered it in a negative way? What would that look like? And now what kind of data would that be? And if you ask yourself that, usually you can get through a pretty good first round of questioning to understand your customer's experience. So if I'm a if I'm a small business and I, I create a survey and I think I've created a pretty strong survey and I incentivize my uh, customers to, to fill it out and I get a pretty good response. Is this the best time where I should really bring a consultant in and say, hey, I've got all this information. Help me interpret it. Help me figure out what the next best steps are. Or should I really have um, someone help me craft those questions or should I um, wait till I actually start talking to clients? Like when's the best time to bring that um, the help in? I think if you're in that place where you're recognizing this is something you want to improve on, then you probably are better off bringing a consultant in beforehand because it could very well be that you're thinking I should ask these questions and the consultant with their experience having done it is going to come in and say, I don't care about those questions. Let's find out this. And so if you do it first and then you bring a consultant in, now they're going to look at that data and they're, they're probably going to say, well, thanks, but it's not over. <laughs> it's not over. And now we got to do that again. And if your client base is small, now you're just hammering them with too many too questions, too much yeah. stuff, right? You've got to still, you've got to respect your buyer's um, anonymity to some extent and their, their desire to be fans without being, um, raving diehard fans, right? Cause you yeah. have a percentage of your, your clientele that are that, but the rest of them are not. So. Right. For sure. So if I, if I have the data and I have a consultant help me, do you take that next step of meeting with people individually and say, okay, let's, let's look at the survey results. Um, we get some really good answers. Do you mind if we talk to a couple of the clients or do you feel like you can get enough of, out of just the data to kind of help the company move forward? In many instances, you can get enough to be able to understand the trajectory that you need to move on next. And that's a good, a good starting spot. There are some instances where things are going really poorly Mm -hmm. that you're like, okay, can we meet with those, you know, 10 people because they said something that was disturbing and we need to get down to the root of the problem of it. Uh, I once went into a company where they brought me in as a spy. It was kind of fun. It's like James Bond. Right? <laughs> and uh, I got to be, you know, in on the bottom level and try to figure it because they couldn't figure it out. And they had hired other consultants. And I said, well, let me come in and pretend to be just one of the mix. And uh, And as I did that, I was able to confirm their suspicion, but they couldn't take any action on it. And the suspicion was that the head of that whole entire department was the problem. Okay. And of course, you know, I don't take anything for granted. So I had to find actual proof. You, know, you had to actually dig in. But the only way I would have known that is by coming in from the bottom end. And I know, I don't know if all consultants are willing to do that. I like it. It's fun, but sure. not everybody's willing to do it. And, and, you know, they, they were willing to pay for me to do that. Okay. That makes sense. But we found out and we turned that coaching department. It was a particular coaching department. We turned that coaching department around and got just that department to actually be worth about $10 million worth of their sales. And then they ended up selling that portion out of their business ultimately. So it was a worthwhile investment when it was all said and done. And we ended sure. up having to get rid of the top end, which is always scary. It's always scary when you have to get rid of top end leadership, when you're not sure that it could be everything underneath it. Yeah, I think I think you mentioned it early on. I think sometimes there's a there's a disconnect um, between ownership and leadership and and what's actually going on, right? So like if, if right. you talk to the owner and you have that initial meeting and you're like, yeah, you know, all of our clients are happy. This is what we provide and this is how we do it. And this is this is exactly what we're doing. And then you start talking to the team members and they're like, oh no, that's that's like yeah. 
fifteen percent of what we do. This is actually this is actually what we do, and I think that's um, that's sometimes where you need to get. It's not it's not the leadership's fault. There. I mean, it is the leadership's fault there, but it's kind of that mid mid tier leadership yeah. there that's pointing them in a different direction than the leadership right. thinks they're going. So um, the whole time you're answering that question, I'm imagining you in your spy gear with your fancy car, ordering a <laughs> drinks with olives in it. You know, all that all that good stuff. So <laughs> yeah, my special watch. You know. Don't chew exactly. the gum the wrong way. It's uh, <laughs> no. I wish it was as glamorous as that. Sometimes it's just rolling up your sleeves and getting in the trenches, uh, and it's it's super fun. But the amount of good we can do from that position is really great. We also uncovered that they had a four-headed dragon leading the ship, and that was a a problem as well. And that was a much harder problem to solve because that was the four-headed ownership uh, that oh, was at wow. play. And and you know those are harder to fix. For sure. No, I've always, so I, I came from working in corporations and working in audit prior to coming to this. And uh, then I kind of got into the consulting role. And that was the first thing that was the biggest challenge for me was noticing right. that the biggest problem with a lot of these companies is just the, the ownership's relationship. And I spent a lot of time being a marriage counselor and being like, <laughs> okay, um, Michael wants to go this way, but this person wants to go this way. So let's, let's talk about what's the best path forward for the company. So That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's it's it can get a little bit a uh, little bit scary. I mean, for those of you that are out there that are smaller right now, and you still are the the leader of the ship, realize that as you build in other partnerships, you can retain that control. I mean, if you look at uh, a lot of people, don't realize that someone like a Jeff Bezos of Amazon, he has a very small percentage of the overall company in terms of what he owns in equity, but he has a very large percentage of control. And so you can structure your deals very carefully. In fact, uh, I think that's starting to get a little bit more visible to people. But just just know that there are ways to structure your deals when you bring in partners to give them equity, but you retain um, decision making control. And and that's a a cool thing. And there are a lot of companies that do that. A lot of the big name corporations that you know of out there, Nike, Amazon. Uh, a lot of them will give up equity, but retain um, ownership, essentially, or control of decision making, because they got that company there and they, they need to maintain that, but they're willing to give away equity so that, that people can share in the, uh, in the upswing of the company. So... I want to ask this question. This will be the last question before we get to the fun, fun question. But um, <laughs> I think our listeners are will really hear that comment, and they'd be mad if I didn't ask this. So, as a CEO or as an owner who wants to keep the control, what's the best steps to make sure that I'm actually aware of what's happening with my company? Again, I'm in the CEO role. This is this is the direction. Like, how do I make sure that my company isn't going a different direction from me, even when I do have that so-called control? Right. I think it's about the people that you put in place and making sure that they're in alignment with your values and the core direction you're going. I also think that as you get to that stage where that's a, a thing where you've hired on a C-suite and maybe you've removed yourself out of that C-suite, which is, you know, that's, that's not that far off for many companies. Once you do that, I think you become sort of the marriage counselor. And I think a lot of ownership uh, positions, they think when they've removed themselves and put in a C-suite that they're done. Vacation yeah. time. I'm going to go off <laughs> and travel around the world. Well, you know, but the thing is, is that your decision-making abilities and your ability to get that company to the point where it could have a C-suite, that's what got you there. And you've got to keep sharing that with the C-suite. You've got to keep making sure that they're on board with your mission and the direction you're going. And I, I call that alignment. And as soon as you're out of alignment, that's usually where you get people in that C-suite that are trying to take over, hostile takeovers, right? You've got mm -hmm. a CEO that's like, I'm going to do this behind everybody's back. Or you've got the CFO that's like, well, I'm not going to tell them about what's going on in the, in the finances, <laughs> right? And, and that happens as soon as the owners or in some cases, multiple owners disconnect themselves from the C-suite. And that's, that's a big, big challenge. But if you can remain in, in a position where you're sharing your vision and alignment, then usually you can avoid that. And I, I think that the good, big part of that to me is 
it's okay to admit you make a mistake, you know, especially when it comes to hiring people. Like if you're looking at your C-suite and you put someone in there that either you just didn't know that well and like based on initial conversations, you thought you were on the same alignment with each other, but then everything, every conversation you have with them, they're pushing back and then they come back to you and say, hey, guess what I did today? And you're like, oh, that's that's not the step direction we want to be going. Sometimes you just got to got to move on from that mistake you made and, yeah. and find find the right people. Because I, I, I agree 100%. And again, I'm not a... I'm not an owner, but I obviously run a department where I, I make sure that the heads of my departments are on the same page with me over and over again, because I think that that is really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So let's get to the fun question. So I, I loved your introduction. Um, I, I don't know if we've had a dancer on the show before, so I, I have to take advantage of this. And so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back to I'm going to go back to entertainment because that's that's the fun place to go. So there's okay. a lot of movies that have um, really fun and key dance scenes in it. Um, so I'm going to ask you, what is the most memorable dance scene in a movie that you've ever seen that you, you go back to and draw upon? Mm, that's a loaded question because I, I am I fear that that by memorable you're also including good um, <laughs> no what's what's the one where you're like wow that's just a great a great dance scene that just that just okay. warms your heart okay okay uh that's fair mind you there are very very it's a very rare occasion that there are good dance scenes of um, course yeah actually <laughs> recently some some of the cartoons are using actual dancers oh, and so okay like puss in boots the the recent one had a dance uh -huh. scene in it and uh, it might have been the original, and it you know they used real dancers to uh, model it after and do the CG after, and so some of that dancing was actually quite good. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, I would say probably one that always sticks in my head is is some of the dance scenes from uh, from Dirty Dancing. Okay. Some of those, they weren't good dancers. None of them were. Yeah. Patrick Swayze was not a good ballroom dancer. And, <laughs> I mean, he, he's a good general dancer, but he just, yeah. Yeah, but, but they were, they were in the context of the story. It was really, they were really fun. Uh, Very memorable. Yep. Yeah. So I think, I think probably that one, it's probably a, one of the classics, I think. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go with a more recent one, but something similar. And it's, it's the reason you're going to like this one because they, they know it's bad dancing. So it's, it's silver linings playbook. I don't know if you've seen that with Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence. In it. Um, yeah. So it's it, the whole, the, a lot of the theme is based on them going to this, this dance competition and they do this just horrible. I mean, it, it was fun and it's a big part of the movie and you really enjoy the dance scene. But then at the, uh, the end, when they do the dancing, like the judges come and like, give them like, they're all acting like it's the greatest dance and all their friends acting like it's the greatest dance ever. And the judges are like 1.2 and like <laughs> 1.4. And like, they, they had to get like a two to win or to not like, um, to win some amount of money or something like that. And of course they get just over the two and it's this huge celebration. So that's, um, that's, that's one that you should definitely check out. It's less, unless bad dancing makes it hard for you to watch movies. I guess I should have said that the movie that my wife was in she was in uh the newest shall we dance and uh oh, okay. she was richard that. gears coach during that time and oh okay uh, and so that was fun it was fun she got to be in the movie she danced with uh, bobby cannavale in that movie oh that's cool too so i guess i could have said that but even then they for as many ballroom dancers that were the real deal and legit that they brought onto the show to do they showed very little good dancing which was unfortunate well what we could do is um we could go back and edit and make it so that's your answer so you don't get in trouble with your wife like we could probably find a way to make that work if you want <laughs> no, no i doubt she'll watch this show <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean of course she will <laughs> <laughs> she, she's like oh you're on a virtual cfo show. you're on a cpa oh, podcast yeah, can't wait to no, add that no, one no. to my list <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So, um, so we're right at the end here, and I, I love to give our, our guests that that final thought. I think you've given tons of pearls of wisdom here, but I want you just to have that one last chance to um, to kind of let our listeners know um, what they should be thinking about to make their business better. Yeah, absolutely. I I really am a proponent for choreography and experience. And so, if you just replace the word choreography with experience, you've got to put together an experience. If you, we've all been to those events mm -hmm. that suck eggs, and you're like, yeah. I'd rather stick a fork in my eye than attend another session of this event. 
And that means they didn't put together a great experience. And there's no excuse for that, not in today's era, not with the amount of information and the people that are incredible at creating experiences. There is zero excuse for it. I don't care if it's a CPA convention or if it's, you know, uh, underwater basket weaving. I don't care what it is. You need to make sure that your experience that you're creating for your customers, your team, and yourself, maybe most importantly, is wonderful and is great. And if you don't do that, it's all going to come back to bite you somewhere. So work on the choreography in your business, uh, and that that's going to make sure that the needle moves for you. Yeah, I think the, the point I heard you say earlier is, is it's make sure you have the accurate picture of what that experience is for people. So don't just assume, you know, ask your employees, ask your customers, ask people what, the, and I think, I think framing it in that way would really make a great question. And I'm sure those are the types of questions that you can help a company, company build is what experience are you getting with us? Is your experience, experience of frustration an experience of, um, just a wheel turning over and over again that doesn't really provide anything for me. Like what experience are you getting? And then once you understand that, it's going to make it easy to, to fix it. So if our, if someone's listening to this podcast and they, they're like, yes, I need to provide a better experience for someone that deals with my company, how would they get hold of you? Oh, easy. Uh, find us at uh, bizchoreo.com, B-I-Z-C-H-O-R-E-O.com. Uh, you can find more about us there. And or if you're just interested in hearing more content from me, you can check me out at Michael Johnson Corio at uh, Instagram or Facebook or wherever. We're on all the socials. We have a podcast, too, that uh, that uh, one of your Jody. Yeah, Jody was on there and unfortunately he couldn't make it today. So he's... Uh, that's OK. But yeah. Jody was on our show. So you should go at least listen to his episode because he was awesome. And um yeah, so we're we're all over the place. You can find us, I hope, in a lot of different ways. <laughs> and, and just so everybody knows, listener wise, I have seen Jody dance, and it, it's not pretty. So <laughs> that, that I would, I just, I just need to throw that out there because he's going to come on some podcasts and tell everybody he's a great dancer, and he's not. So just just so everybody knows, I have to throw awesome. that out there. I love great. It. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, yeah, this was a fun episode. Absolutely. Thanks for having. Me. Enjoy this podcast. Yeah, no Visit our website, summitcpa.net, to get more tips and strategy for achieving business success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry.